Hello, and welcome to The Dentrepreneur Show. Welcome to The Dentrepreneur Show. This is Dr. D. Todd Russell. Today with me is a very special guest, a gentleman I more recently got to know, attorney, expert in mergers and acquisitions, expert in law all over the place, Mr. Len Garza. Len, welcome to my show. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, Len, we met a couple weeks ago and we chatted and we had this great conversation then. And we started even before the show with another great conversation. Um, and, you know, I like to start off by, you know, your, your background, your history, and I can read it off of LinkedIn, but it comes much better when it comes from you. So please give my, my listeners and my subscribers just a quick rundown of, you know, who you are and why we're here together. Sure, absolutely. So as you said, Len Garza, I'm an attorney. I'm based out of Princeton, New Jersey, but I have clients all over the nation, right? So I uh, have a, we have a fully virtual law firm. It's me and two other attorneys, small team of under five, and we like it that way, right? We're very boutique, very specific. And I personally uh, have been practicing law for almost 20 years, most of that time at law firms, larger mid-sized law firms represented the gamut of companies, right? Uh, Fortune 50 companies to smaller family-owned businesses to solo entrepreneurs. A few years ago, broke off on my own to run my own law firm. And as I tell my business owner clients, I'm not only a lawyer who advises business owners as I was before in those firms, but now I'm one of you. I'm a business owner myself. So that was really one of the biggest points. I mean, there's all, you know, I like to think there's always these before and after points in life. Uh, this event happened and this is what I was like before. And this is my new understanding. Breaking off on my own was definitely one of them. It uniquely put me in the shoes of a business owner. Different, right? isn't it? Because it's totally different. It's very different. And you know, practicing in a larger firm, it, it just never could have done that, right? I could, I could understand my clients and businesses from an intellectual level. And a lot of times that was fine. A lot of times that's completely fine, but there's that extra appreciation when you're in the driver's seat and nobody can steer but you. You know, other people that might be in your ear about, oh, you should do this, do that. Many times people are in your ear about that. And so learning, okay, who do I listen to? Who do I tune out? But at the end of the day, you're the one pushing the button and deciding where the ship is going to go, right? So, so many things that I felt like a complete newbie about, despite how experienced I was right. as a lawyer, right? How critical it is to identify, you know, your ideal client as a business, ideal customer, marketing sales pipeline. How do they find out about you? You can be the best in the world best dentist, best lawyer, best manufacturer, whatever it is. If nobody knows about you, doesn't matter. Right. That was a huge moment for me. Like, wait a minute, no. I can't just build it and they'll automatically come. Right. Um, I, I've got to actually, I've got to actually be intentional about this, right. right. In ways that I didn't have to before. So I, I mean, so many things, it's so many big aha moments, but like I said, I, I inter understood kind of those things on an intellectual level, but the clarity of just how important all that stuff was, uh, it really hit me once I was a business. Yeah. You, myself. you touched on, I mean, again, here we go uh, to my listeners, the word tangents. Um, you know, I gotta, when, when I do have a guest on, I, I pre email them some questions of where we want to go. And then all of a sudden the show takes on its own, its own flavor. And here in your introduction, you're killing me with things already. Um, <laughs> but I call it being in the weeds in order to understand a business you have to get in the weeds. I remember um, Camelon. Do you remember Camelon? I don't even know if they're still around. They were the guys, you know, Mr. Weed, they'd come around and weed your lawn. I remember hearing about them as a kid and mm -hmm. the guy, my parents had hired them or we had, I can't remember how it all went down, but I remember the gentleman saying to someone, my mom or my dad or me, that he was a new employee. He's actually a Man, he's actually a management level employee, but what they did is he had to drive the truck and spray lawns for the first four months that he worked in that company. Then he could move into the corporate offices and everything, but it was so key for that company that you understood the weeds. 
right? Mm -hmm. Literally and figuratively right. with my example here. But it's the same thing. Right. It's exactly what you're saying. You were working for a law firm, but you didn't do any HR. You didn't do any retirement planning. You didn't do any marketing. You didn't do, you know, you had a piece of it, a little touch here and there. Right. Before doing. Now you're doing it for you. And it is a whole different ball game. When you add that on top of, oh, Len, by the way, you've got to prepare this for all these clients. So you got all that on top of all this right. new stuff. And it can make it difficult. Same thing in the world of dentistry. My running line with my teams is I'm head of maintenance and chief of security. Oh, and I'm also the DDS in the building. Like, right. you know, I, I'm everything or chief, right. uh, it's a chief cook and bottle washer. I, you know, it's, it's all that thing. And so people come into, into the dental space. And this is my, my, one of my things about DSOs. That's the large dental groups, right? It's, it's people who don't know, who've never been in the weeds and the, the better run organizations, the ones that have dentists as part of the C-suite or part of the um, advisory board, because we're the ones that can say, yeah, you can't balance that with this because of this, this, and this. But when you're flying at 36,000 feet, looking down, it's so easy to go, oh, we'll change this and do that. And it's not the same. It's just, it's just not the same until you get in those weeds. It's critical. It's critical, Todd. And just knowing the intricacies of that particular business, that particular deal, that mm -hmm. that makes so much difference. Right. It can be the difference between a particular deal going through or not going through, or if the deal goes through, it falling apart soon later because the powers that be don't understand some of the forces. They just don't understand right. that business or, or dentistry, and they hit those icebergs right. that practitioners know to avoid yeah right but if they're not in the positions of the higher up positions of power or, or of directorship or management do those voices get heard right you know right yeah all right well listen first of all um let's go back a little bit on on how we met because i think that's important and in somewhat of a, a plug to our mutual friend len wright connected us and it's through the magazine online a magazine called acquisition affection auto please check it out acquisition affection auto.com uh, you'll see in the month of April, I wrote an article. Len's been a contributor as a contributor as well. It's a it's what a thirty six dollar yearly subscription, I think. Len, I can't even. Remember. Oh, it's, it's it's right. It's it's very pennies. very nominal. It's pennies, yeah. right? Right. And then you wind up. I think you can get mine currently for free. Um, I think they do like the prior three months and then going forward, it kind of goes in the archives and then you get the more recent ones free, but it's got some great content and all the stories are, they're quick reads. That's what I like about it too. You get some really good stuff in a three, four page article. Um, and then there's like 10 of them in every episodes or ep I'm sorry, every edition. So anyhow, Len Wright, if you were listening, uh, you, we plugged you today because we, we love you, man. Um, <laughs> So let's get into the big question. All right. So, and this is, you know, this has been the theme for the first, uh, I don't know, dozen or so of my, of my podcast, but I'm so focused uh, as we started it earlier before we actually uh, started recording. It's about preparing my colleagues, uh, small business owners, but dentists is where I'm focused, but it could be attorneys. It's when do you start thinking about your exit plan? When I ask you that, Len, you read the article I wrote, you know, my number, I think it's around 35 for a dentist, but I could be wrong. Um, it could be, maybe it's well, not an age. I, maybe it's something related to the career. What do you think? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to be pretty, I think 35 is great, but uh, just I'll be short and say now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm a big believer in beginning with the end in mind, especially with, with big things in your life, such as career, you know, dentistry, you, you know, your, your business, your profession. And asking that question, where do I want to be at the end of this? Doesn't mean you have to have that etched and sewn and end up there, but just asking that question, I'll have you asking other important questions that you might not otherwise ask. You wouldn't otherwise mm -hmm. ask. What's your vision? Do you have one? You know, it's a very different vision between somebody saying, look, I'm going to go start my own dental practice. I'm going to go be a solopreneur and I'm going to do, uh, do things like that. I liked what you said before about um, uh, you start something with the end in mind. Um, yes. Okay. Sort of work right. backwards. Oh. I kind of like that thinking. That's a, a, of the other guests I've had on with the same question, getting different yeah. answers. All none of them wrong, but they all have a mindset right. that you need to think about. I love that. Like work backwards, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And that's yeah. where you know the things I talk about valuation of your practice now. 
the key components that you can do to improve revenue and improve efficiencies and cultures, all of that starts with what does it look like ideally in your mind and how do you get there, right? Same idea. Right. It, it, it makes you ask those questions, Todd. When you start thinking about those questions, you know, when you start thinking about where do I want this to end, that, you know, the mind is, is an amazing thing. It, it starts leading to other questions that you might not otherwise think of. And, you know, let's face it, and the world that we're in, I, I'm sure we all know, you know, with our phones, there's so many distractions, trying to block out those distractions, focus on your business, business owners wearing so many different hats, having to try to keep the business running, what's coming up this week, next month, next quarter, next year, or a few years, if, if you even have that, there's so much on your mind, but really forcing yourself as a business owner to think beyond that, past that. Right. What do I want out of this, right? right. The, the really key questions and then working backward from that because without a well thought, thought out plan uh, as a business owner, you don't realize it, but your options start closing on you. You don't realize what those options are, but they do start closing, right? And so when you finally realize that you do want to sell and, I, and I've had some business owner, some business owners come to me in this situation, they're later in life right? Maybe mm -hmm. in their 60s. I remember a particular um, particular uh, orthopedic surgeon who was, you know, in, in his early 70s. He's like, Lan, I, I feel, feel great mentally. I feel like I could do this another 30 years, but physically I'm, I'm tired. You know, that this is, right. uh, this is really wearing on me. And he said, you know, he was a sole practitioner. And he said, no partners, no juniors working for the firm with him as of yet or working in the practice with him as of yet. He had no plan. His understanding was he could just, hey, talk to a lawyer, talk to a CPA and say, oh, I want to sell my business. And I'd like to look at selling my business next year. Mm -hmm. um, can he find a buyer? Well, number one, you need a lot, lot longer runway, <laughs> as we'll talk about, I'm sure, in a little bit. But even if he had that, can he find a buyer? For his practice, maybe, but uh, it's going to be at a discount, probably. For yeah, you're not yeah, going to get full okay. value because it's it's too late in the game, and someone knows you at that point. You're desperate, yeah. so why would I pay full tilt for it? I'll just lowball it and see what I get. So you're not going to get full value. It kind of leads to my next question, anyhow, which yeah. is, you know, as far as someone who is looking to sell or exit, you know, areas that they need to know well before they go to market. I think one thing you we're kind of talking about is the timeline. The timeline right. is important, dear 35-year-old self, not dear 70-year-old self, right? That's the timeline. Right. What other things right. do you see with the businesses that you've been involved in, you know, whether they be in medical or, or anything else? What are some of the key areas right. you think they need to know well before they decide it's time to sell? Yeah. So really, you know, looking at it from, from put yourself in a potential buyer's shoes, right? Uh, do you have a business or a practice that someone wants to buy? Oh, well, you don't want to guess at what that is. There are metrics and there are things that make a business like yours, whatever it is, more, more likely to be attractive to a potential purchaser and some things that make it less likely to be attractive. Some of those things may be obvious, right? right. Some of those things may be, okay, for somebody looking to sell in their 70s, this person is looking probably for an out, they're tired, that probably goes, turns the meter as far as leverage you may have in selling your business, probably turns the meter towards uh, less leverage versus more leverage, right? But it's kind of a sliding scale. So, um, you know, what makes a business attractive to your buyer? Well, it's like, well, what is your business worth? Um, that's key. You don't wanna do something that's back of the napkin. You want actually a formal valuation. You know, I see so many business owners that, that come with the, uh, the the conviction that oh nobody knows my business like i do i know what it's worth but there are actually technical specifications laid out for valuations mm -hmm. so if you go forward with the kind of misunderstanding that oh i know what how my business run i inherently know the value or the worth um you could unknowingly shoot yourself too low or too high where neither is good. You want that Goldilocks, uh, that Goldilocks feeling, right? Right in the middle, something, because again, you don't want to put your business on market or waste a lot of your time, spin your wheels if your price is too high. And then obviously nobody wants to have it too low and just leave money on the table from, right. from all your years of hard work. Right. 
Right. And there's, you know, like you said, when it comes to the valuations, there is a process. Every industry has key things that need to be looked at. I guess that's a question I kind of have a little bit later. It has to do what are some of the key things when it comes to, you know, valuing the business. And of course, there's the tangibles. We all know that. I mean, as a a, a dental group, a little different than probably a law law office, right? You guys don't have much as far as tangible assets. You've got some desks and some computers and that's about it. We have all this dental equipment, but unfortunately, many of my colleagues, what they don't understand is it's like buying a car the second you take it off the lot it's worth you know 50 percent less and dental equipment it's exactly the same thing so there's yeah there's some value there but there's not a lot the other value is the intangible and that's the goodwill and the the patient population and but then other intangibles the culture the systems right if you were able to in a law firm uh have a ray croc method of working clients through your system to deliver them the end result product, it's great, right? We know that the law is a little different because you have so much creativity that has to, every case is a little bit different, but if there was a way you could do it, that would add value, right? Like having that system. So you still, I'm assuming, again, I'm not an attorney, I'm not in a law firm, but I know that we are trying to replicate ourselves in our offices as much as we can systemize the better it is. Now, uh-huh. I practice clinically, as you know, still. So all of this stuff crazily is in my head, right? My system right. is in my head. So it's easy for me. Right. It's putting pen to paper, showing others how to do it, and then getting them to execute it the way I've done it so successfully. And that's a challenge, but that is Absolutely. value add. That is value add though. That is a big valuation component is that system. Um, right. What else have you seen though, like in determining value? What are yeah. the key components do you see? Well, what you mentioned there is huge, Todd, whether it be for a law firm or or, or really there, you know, we start coming to the important things between the difference between what is your business or or practice? Is it a product or is it a service Mm -hmm. or is it a little bit of both, Mm -hmm. right? Because if it's a service, you know, then you start looking into, okay, this is knowledge work. There's a lot of goodwill with that. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, well, for a potential acquirer, are they going to be able to capture that and use that? Or once you're gone, is all the value or most of the value gone, right? And if most of the value is gone, in other words, you as uniquely a person, the business owner, and this is the way a lot of professions are, you know, physicians, dentists, uh, engineers, uh, accountants, lawyers, a lot of this have to think and prepare like this. Mm-hmm. If you don't have systems in place, right, that somebody can come in and pick those up, then a big part of that often that I see in these type of deals is you staying on for a certain amount of time, right? um, which is not ideal for a lot of business owners. So you're talking about being the captain of your own ship for many years, maybe decades, and then all of a sudden, right at the end, you're going to be an employee of somebody else. That can be a really tough pill to swallow, um, regardless of how much uh, it, it's a mindset. It's a mindset thing. So people do it all the time, but it's important to know that if you don't have systems and other things in place, if you want to avoid that or have the buyout structure differently um, and not just take whatever you get, there are certain this is why you need a longer runway before you sell sure. before you right. sell. If you don't want to do that, right. There are ways to plan where that's less likely, but without planning, you're going to pretty much have to take what you get and you may not like what you get. This is just another system. That's, this is what this is. Yeah. The planning yeah. is a system. I reference it as in a logarithm, right? Like the if then right. statements back in the day when we were learning how to program computers, which I assume they right. still program that way, but mm-hmm. you know, it's understanding that that pathway. Okay. When I get to this point, I'm going to have these four things that I can choose from. And I always talk right. about, um, and in fact, I did it on my, another show earlier. I talked to another guest and they said the same thing. I said, you get to this point, you have these four things in front of you. You should explore all four paths because Uh you might fall in love with one, but then something happens and one gets X'd out. Now, at least you understand and are ready for two and you can move forward very quickly. But the system of pulling it all together, finding the right experts and helping you to build that, that platform where you get to your end goal. And your end goal, right. but there can you can start off and go like this, but then with the algorithm, you come over here, then you got to go over there, and then you come back down, and all of a sudden, you, you finally wind up there. But you know all those pathways. In your career, have you dealt much with um, 
acquisitions with roll-ups with you know groups whether it be dental or optometry a veterinarian yes. have, you, have you been involved in some of those deals um, i have yeah they so so we're time we're having this conversation is you know april 2023 there's still some of those going on um a couple of years ago though todd they were hot yeah. very hot right um they've cooled off a little bit at least on my end not to say they aren't still going on but a couple of years ago they were they were hot um a, a lot of a lot of roll-ups did did uh quite a few then from the sales side right representing physician practices getting rolled up you know by private equity buying up and uh so yeah did quite a bit and and i mean obviously there's a whole other series do a whole series of, of podcasts just on that issue and stories yeah. around roll-ups and and issues around those right? private so, equity trust me so, i know i'm i'm exactly. in that space now and uh you know exactly. i kick myself because it's not it's not as pretty as you think it is um and that thing get, is again it, this is where we talk about you know very industry or multiple industry specific um you know you look at, at healthcare, you know dentistry and everything and the pressures the economic pressures political pressures Mm -hmm. that have been on that mm -hmm. and the pressure is intense on physicians dentists and all of them to try to find out you know from getting burnt out doing what they're doing i mean the laws have been changing over the decades to where now private equity roll-ups start to look very attractive because uh strength in numbers it's harder and harder to find sole or private practitioners um, just because of the economics, they're, they're getting lesser and lesser. Yeah, it, it definitely gets harder and harder to be uh, the the term you used earlier, solopreneur. I love that. Oh, by the way, but I have to steal that one from you. Um, <laughs> but it's it's getting harder and harder because you're right uh, with um, the way the um, employment current environment is, and uh, you know what employees are looking for and the demands they put on your time. It's hard to keep abreast of the laws related to that, let alone the the demands and conditions that the employee is expecting. Um, the nice thing about a you know a roll up is you yeah you can leverage uh, the group buying power right and get things at a lesser cost which then improves the bottom line. But of course if you have you have people who all they do all day long is look at your bottom line and ask why not, why are you not where you're supposed to be and blah, blah blah without ever looking at any of the detail or getting in the weeds going back to our earlier part of the conversation it right. can be frustrating being in that space. I don't know in the law world you guys have always had a great. Um, you guys have a great process, I think, in that you bring in the associates and then you have a, a trajectory where they can make partner. Um, mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you've got a group of 200 attorneys where 50 of them are partners and 150 are associates hoping to come. I, I've always admired that. I think the law, and again, you'll probably correct me, it's not all roses all the time, but <laughs> I think it's, a, I think the, I think that the legal profession has done pretty well with bringing in associates. Dentistry, mm -hmm. go back to what we said before about before about being a solo doc, it's hard to bring somebody in. This is my way, you're gonna learn it my way. And then the other dentist comes in and goes, no, I wanna do it my way. And then there's that, that headbutting that occurs. Right. Um, and it, it's, it, I wish we could change it, but it, and I think it is changing in our world because of these young dentists are coming out and the big issue is debt. Um, and that's oh, one of the reasons absolutely. why the DSOs and the and this um, the uh, the roll ups are working is because these kids are saddled with, I mean, three quarters, four hundred thousand dollars, uh, three yeah, three hundred yeah, four hundred thousand dollars in debt, uh, three quarters right. of a million is what I was going to say, and mm -hmm. um, or it, as much as that, I've seen some you know they go to the private dental school, they go to the private undergrad, and all of a sudden they're in debt three quarters of a million dollars. I can't even imagine that. They don't even have that kind of mortgage right. on my house. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, right. So now they just need a job just to afford the debt that they've created. And it's it's 15 years before they actually start to to, you know, no longer drive a beat up Honda Accord. Um, right. I don't know. Right. But anyhow, I, that's again, you, you mentioned that earlier. It's a, this is a topic we can oh. go on a whole other show about. These whole sure. So there is so exactly what you mentioned, Todd. I mean, these things don't say static. Right. They change over the years. They change with laws. They change with regulations. The economics of practicing, you know, as a physician, dentist have changed. Practicing now is not the same as it was practicing in 2000, is not the same as it was practicing in the 1980s. 
or 19, God forbid, 1960s. Right. So much regulation has come along. So many, um, you know, with, with all the focus on on healthcare and trying to to bring, uh, trying to make healthcare more affordable and more accessible for all. And again, not to get into a political conversation, but it, this thing does become very political and doctors are stuck in the middle. Physicians are stuck in the middle and dentists are. And at the end of the day, it's great that you want to help that you want to help patients. This is a calling. This is what you do. But you have to be able to pay, make ends meet, and pay your bills, right? And that, Which, that's right. unavoidable. And I mean, this goes to another part of. I want to say that I I preach about this, but this is where you need to surround yourself with experts. You are not. You're a dentist again. My, I'm a dentist, so the show is about dentistry, right? You're a dentist. You are not an attorney. You are not an accountant. Mm -hmm. You are not a marketer. You're not a director of human resources. You don't have those experiences. You need to find good people. And I always say, listen, your neighbor who's an accountant, who is a good tax prep attorney may not be the best accountant for you because mm -hmm. they aren't familiar with our space or with, let's talk about mergers and acquisitions. I mean, many accountants have been a part of practice sales or business sales, but do they really know the transactions related to dentistry? So go out and find a Len Garza when you need to have your documents reviewed, when you need to have documents prepared for 15 years from now, have someone like yourself be part of your team. Don't think you can go it alone. So important. Um, right. And again, I think that falls to the system. It's, it doesn't sound like that should be a system. Oh, my system is having um, good advisors. Yeah, it actually is. It is part of your system. Yeah, and they can show you the blind spots, right? At, you know, we've been there, done that, seen so many cases, and we're going to, we don't know it all. Like, we're going to continue. It's a lifelong thing. It's mm -hmm. not a finite. You get to some point. And then you're an M&A attorney who has seen it all, knows it all. That's not the way life works, right? Mm -hmm. At least this. Same thing, I'm sure, with dentistry. There's not some magical point that right. you can say, oh, I don't need to review any books. I don't need to keep abreast right. of everything. I'm, I've arrived. I'm right. there. It just, that's not the way it is. But there, there's a huge benefit from yeah. leaning on others' experience. And, and I see this too many times with with business owners especially ones that have you know learned it educated many degrees um think that uh you know you have to know it all it's like what we talked about earlier you know yeah. and, and i i tell them it's like look being independent and i stole this from somebody else I, it may have even been oprah i heard oprah say it i think but <laughs> just because you're independent doesn't mean you're alone lean right. on others yeah. don't stay all up here between the ears and that's great you utilize all the skills you like to learn knowledge that's excellent do that but don't think that it ends there lean on other advisors to be able to leverage and help yourself mm -hmm. so so powerful Str solid words um and now we know that oprah is you're a fan of oprah so <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, yeah, actually, apparently so you, i am i guess right? yeah yeah that's okay that, um again yeah. i've said this uh, on other uh, times on my show um uh, i think it was dave kittle who actually connected me with Len Wright. And so now you, but uh, Dave and I were talking about it. It's, um, I said, a plagiarism is alive and well in business. And he said, well, <laughs> uh, technically it's modeling. And I go, okay, call it what you want. Uh, I used to coach modeling. sports and I coached yeah. some collegiate sports. Uh, and so I used to say coaching was plagiarism. Huh, that worked, you know, and you, and you mark it down and then you steal it and then you practice it, right? Um, yeah. it's, it's yeah. the same thing. And what we're talking about, the modeling is great. The, the play, go yeah. ahead, learn from somebody else, how certain things are done and don't be afraid to keep doing it that way. As we were talking about, as you were talking just a second ago about the, you know, success and not so much success leads me to my next question. Give me an example of, um, a successful transition that you've worked through and then, Come on, tell us a fun story about one that didn't quite go so well. I mean, I know you've probably got tens of thousands on both sides of that. But. Oh, my gosh. I, you know, so so it, it, I'm trying to cherry pick of, of a lot of them. I, I, I What comes to mind right now, maybe a specific example will come up just right now. But the ones that and I'll just go ahead and use the word. They're fun. They're intellectually fun to work on or are things we've already been talking about already, Todd. Um, their attorneys on the other side who do this, 
right? M&A attorneys. There's advisors on the other side. I'm working with a team of advisors as well. I'm working with, you know, an overall business strategist, maybe somebody like yourself, who's kind of quarterbacking, backing, bringing everybody together. I'm also working with the CPA accountant because I have a very high level overview of tax issues, but I don't get in the weeds. I shouldn't be getting in the weeds, no. right? So when I'm talking to the CPA, I say, oh, can you please help us work out what we're going to do about working capital, the taxation from, mm -hmm. from one side to the other? I issue spot. I know that that's an issue, but I'm not the one to be digging in. I, I'm not a CPA, right? So I work very closely with the CPA, make sure they're aware. Same token, however that works out, however they work out the calculations, I'm the one that has to get the legal verbiage correct to make sure those those financial calculations and what the CBA says gets translated and is legally effective with the words that I use in the contract, mm -hmm. right? So it really goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, and you talk about overall finance and business strategy, you know, business strategist. Um, you just, you need that team to work with because you go through a period when you're selling your business um, called due diligence, right? And for those of you who don't know what due diligence is, it's just, it, it's further investigation. You know, it's like you're buying a car, look under the hood, yeah. right? Turning so over all after, the rocks. After you get past that first phase of, okay, I like them. They like me. I think we may have even had a dinner, nice Zoom call. This is great. Okay, where 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 does it go after that? Well, we need to find out more about each other. What does that mean? Well, they're going to want to ask as a seller, as a buyer, they're going to want to say, okay, please give us your financials. Let's see what the numbers look like. As a lawyer, right, I'm going to say, okay, please show me your, your contracts. Do you have ongoing co customer or client contracts I need to look mm -hmm. at? Or who are your top 10, 20 customers? Who are your top 10, 20 vendors, right? And, and, and so we're going to want to see all that because devil's in the details with all yeah. that stuff. So by and large, I mean, I've had many really good uh, transactions. I think that's why it's hard to pick out one type, but they all have this in common is that they seem to work together in lockstep. And the number of un something unpredictable always comes out. But if you have those that are experienced, you know how to handle it. Right. Kind of like right. in football, you know, a, a quarterback, Tom Brady or a LeBron or whatever, the unexpected things are going to happen. But the experienced ones, you know how to keep a cool head about yep. it and you don't panic and when you goes, don't have. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Then that goes back no, to just ahead. a minute ago where we're talking about people having having that good set of advisors. Mm -hmm. So your best trend, if I can sum what you just kind of said, sure. the most successful or the best transactions you've seen are ones where you and your team are working with uh, a seller who has a prepared path and a solid set of advisors that have been on board for a long time. And because you're the pros pro and they're the pros pro and no one's haphazarding any of this stuff, the transaction goes smoothly. Even when the hiccups exactly. show along, when the hiccups right. show up, you guys are like, ah, okay, we'll get through this. You know, no right. big deal. Yeah. And for those of you that have not been through a sale and many of my colleagues have not, it won't come till, you know, 60, 65, maybe, maybe sooner, maybe later, but the whole due diligence process is taxing. Um, mm -hmm. you know, they want to look at, uh, every single line item on your credit card statement, which goes back to, if you work with me as a strategist, I'm going to show you, look at, you need to just record that that's personal, not that you're telling the IRS, we don't have to get into tax games and all that kind of stuff, but it's, it's having that record so that it's easy to defend, I guess, or to answer the questions about it. Oh yeah, this is that, right? and you can say with confidence. And it helps with all those hiccups. They become with with the pros surrounding you, and so the pros surrounding the buyer. It makes it really easy. Okay, Len. Now, and for real the, quick, now, Todd, with yeah. that, you with with an advisor such as yourself or the right advisors, you're a sounding board, right? They can they can say, Todd, what what? How do I explain this? What what I and the, oh, right. do I need to do I need to to give them a, a big apologia? And this was all the background. And you or I may be able to say, you don't have to do any of that. It, right. it, it's not that big of a deal. You just have to be direct with them and state X, Y, and Z. Nothing more, nothing less. And that can be a huge mental weight off of them thinking, oh, hopefully it's not that big of a deal. But if you don't have an advisor who knows what they're doing, you can get in a panic and think the deal's gonna go sideways over something that may not be that important. 
um, right. and know what to know what are the big issues to focus right. on, which is versus which are only the speed bumps. Um, okay, real quick here, we're gonna wrap up the show pretty soon for today. Give me a fun, maybe a fun transaction that didn't go so great. And I say fun because you know a lot of times it might be the personality of uh, the buyer, the right. seller. Do you have a you have a good story right. along those lines, Lynn? Oh uh, yeah, I, I, well, this a number of different transactions kind of like this. But again, what is it? Well, it's it, it has many of the things that we say you should have. These were missing a lot of those things, right? So this was a particular transaction. It was a manufacturer that I was dealing with for for a sale, um, a sale of their company, and the buyer was one of these bigger conglomerates that you know just essentially was like a roll up, right? And sure. and we were selling to them, um, and it became very obvious very quickly that the attorney they used from the other side was not a, an m a experienced m a attorney wasn't even a business uh, maybe a business attorney but primarily he did litigation he was in court all the time well that came in through loud and clear when i was talking with him he made conversations very combative it was always a zero-sum game if he wins something i had to lose i and my client had to lose vice versa um and that's just not the way to get these deals done right i mean we're all wanting to get across the finish line he had his client um threaten to cancel the deal terminate um even take us to court multiple times during the negotiations closing the deal and of course my client no matter how many times i tried to reassure them look it, this is just saber rattling i believe this guy he's obviously an experience it didn't help my client who you know he didn't go he hasn't been through a number of these deals this was his first business sale right right, that he'd been, right. He'd oftentimes it is so so him hearing this and seeing the emails was incredibly distressing to him. How many Friday afternoons going into the weekend did I have to get on the phone with them and calm him down and say, hey, this is the roller coaster that we talked about. It's one of the things I plant the seed very early on. I say, look, you want to sell your business. You've got a buyer, a potential buyer. You've got the letter of intent. It's not done, right? Just because you've got the signed letter of intent, there are going to be lots of turns, twists and turns, don't count your chicken before they're hatched. Be optimistic, yeah. but don't count your, the deal's not done until the ink's dry, right? And I say, be prepared for the twists and turns. So you'll know that everything, everything that happens doesn't mean it's going to be the end of the deal. It just right. means another hoop to go over. And so th yeah. this deal, it was, it was a nightmare. The, the other attorney was very difficult to deal with. There was actually a point where his client was on the phone and I mean, big egos all around, as you can imagine, Todd, and he 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 canceled the deal right on the phone. I mean, he didn't sign off on anything, but we all got off the conference call and I talked to my client and I said, let me get let them cool down a little bit. Let me get the other attorney back on the phone and let's bring everybody back together. But there was a lot of wasted energy on my client's side. I know on their side as well, just by really people not knowing what they're doing on the other side. It goes uh, back to that. And at the end of the day, the end of the day, it closed. But wow, a lot yeah. more heartburn. I'm sure my client got a lot more gray hair because of yeah. that. But it did. Close. And again, it goes back to surrounding yourself with good experts like yourself. Yeah. There, I mean, that's a, yeah. the perfect segue into that. It's, it's, uh, that's who you need. You need good people. And, and by the way, I'm sure this person was really good in the courtroom. Whereas someone like yourself would really probably good, not right. be a great, you know, you, you wouldn't be as good, right? Cause that's not what you, you got. You got to know your strengths. You right. got to know your strengths. Being Absolutely. in the courtroom. I did that earlier in my career when I thought that's what I wanted to do. We're talking about about 20 years ago, not my temperament, yeah. right? Todd, I, I'm much, I realized and finally got my way into this where I'm much more on the transaction side and, and, and pushing things pushing things through and finding consensus and getting us across the finish line. I, I'm passionate about that. It's what I love doing. Um, so to each their own, but not the area for a combative lawyer, litigation lawyer, um, I don't think. Well, Lynn, I'm going to wrap up the show and I close with a, a question to you. Um, and, you know, we talk about these experts, but we also, I also like to talk about people who've influenced us. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a person. Um, I've had great answers. I had one gentleman on my show who read a poem that influenced him. Uh, someone said it was his dad. 
Another person yeah. said it was as more recent, uh, this person, this person. Um, in my case, I talk about uh, some of the books I've read and some of the, the speeches I've heard, um, famous people who wrote the biographies that really influenced me. Who Who's influenced Len Garza? Oh, man, so many, Todd. I, I'm, I'm a huge, you I mean, obviously, my parents, you know, they both grew up in the school system, you know, educators, um, really, really started off my you know, thirst and, and lifelong curiosity for knowledge. I mean, I love learning, love learning new things, love being around people that, uh, you know, like-minded people like yourself that just, you know, love learning things, but also not just learning for the sake of learning, but learning to to help others as well. It really, for me, is what makes the world go around. So with that, this is close to the top of my list. I mean, if you ask me a different day, it's, oh, I read this, this, this inspirational quote this morning yeah. that I love yeah, or yeah. this or yeah. whatever, but I'll say just a, a couple, right? So um, things keep on coming up over and over that I like of theirs. So Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett, right? Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger is, is his advisor. You know, uh, I think he used to be his lawyer. I don't know if whether he's his lawyer now or, or, or overall um, kind of advisor, mm -hmm. but really it's just... Um, Every time I hear Charlie Munger speak, and these are the principles kind of Warren Buffett too, is just the importance of fundamentals in everything. And their tenet of only investing in what you understand and so many things. And I think that's so important to keep in mind. And no matter what you do, there are so many fads, there are so many crazes, whether it be financial investments in your industry, whatever, you know, I'm not that DSOs are a fad, but you know, they're like, hey, they're they're a thing that wasn't around you know, years ago, right? Right. right. And, and they've yeah, been a hot thing. Like staying, we don't know. Right. Right. And, and rather, I mean, there, there are things like that in law, finance, whatever you want to say, they're the hot thing, uh, you know, fear of missing out. If I, if I, as a business owner, don't do that thing or get in on that. And just the, the wisdom of, 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 you know what, focus on the fundamentals. If your business is having trouble, Focus on the fundamentals. Get back to the fundamentals. If your business is doing great, don't lose sight of the fundamentals. Right. right? Just so many things. Right. And, and, and I think that's much easier said than done. Yeah. Myself and clients included because, man, when business is going great, you really want to ride that wave. And great. Should do that. But you, don't, you want to make sure you don't get too, too far out over your skis mm -hmm. and not know how to get back. To what those fundamentals are and then another one that goes into that is uh i really like jim Rohn. you know success yeah. coach jim Rohn. uh i see some videos online pop up and, and man it's just compelling stuff about just um really putting in a hard work and 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 going about things and and the faith to take chances as an entrepreneur faith to take chances he says one of my favorite things he says is like oh you're you're in business now and and don't want to go off on your own or you're scared of going off on your own, but it's something you want to do. Everything's risky, right. you know. Going out on your own is risky. Staying in in the position, maybe the job that you're at, you know, it seems stable, but you don't really realize the risk that may be there, or layoffs right. or whatever. Right. So it's like everything's risky. Pick your risk, yeah. you know. And I, I just that resonates that has resonated with me so many times in my life but you know those those are great. those are a few of mine yeah great stuff lynn oh well listen i can't thank you for enough for your time today you have been excellent as i knew you would and of course you're going to be back because like you said that or that whole segment we could talk about on roll-ups would be um and maybe even bring in a third person that i'm thinking of that might uh, be great for us to banter around um but anyhow uh lynn how can people get a hold of you Best way is to go to our website, right? Garza, Garza Business and Estate Law. The website is lgarzalaw.com. Very important that you get the name right because I my, my name is last name. There are other Garzas out there. So make sure you get the right name. It's L-G-A-R-Z-A. LAW.com. Uh, and there has ways that I, I you can contact us. We have educational videos for business owners to view educational blog posts. And uh, if you want to go a little bit deeper and set up an appointment with me, you can do that through our online link as well. So very easy. 
by the way, uh, I did I did check out your website uh, about a month ago or so, and I, I was really impressed with the with the videos and the different things you guys have in there. I thought those were really helpful for potential clients. So uh, that's elgarzalaw.com is how you can find Len. Go to his website, and then you can connect with him there. Um, this is the Dentrepreneur Show. Uh, I am Dr. D. Todd Russell. I thank you for listening. You can find us on um, Apple Music, uh, Spotify, as well as uh, my YouTube channel, which is Dentrepreneur LLC. Uh, uh, and my website, dentrepreneurllc.com. Please look me up. Please subscribe, like, uh, thumbs up, all that stuff. Um, I've got some exciting more guests uh, coming your way. And so I'm looking forward to also having Len back on the show. Len, thank you for your time today. Thanks a lot, Todd. Have a great one. Thank you for joining us. Please follow or subscribe to this show on Spotify, Apple, or YouTube. If you would like further information or to meet with me one-on-one -on -one and discuss your practice, please feel free to contact me through my website, dentrepreneurllc.com. Many more exciting guests and topics are headed your way.